My name is Paul Boven. I work with uh, Jive. I also am an external PhD candidate at the moment at the University of Leiden. And I'm a volunteer at the 25 meter radio dish in Dwingelo, the Netherlands. And all of that will be coming in this presentation. Uh, this is yeah, this works. Okay. So, first of all, I'm going to tell you what Wide Rabbit is. Uh, some people have already mentioned it a little bit. Uh, we'll discuss what interferometry is and then how you can use Wide Rabbit to obtain good interferometric me measurements and what you can and what you cannot do with White Rabbit if you try and doing that. And then we run into some troubles with White Rabbit, we see how we can improve it and then show how we can actually do radio astronomy with it. So White Rabbit is an open source, open hardware repository from CERN. It was designed to uh, simplify the synchronization of the Large Hadron Collider and all their other accelerators. It's very nice that it's open source, open hardware, and it offers one nanosecond stability out of the box. And I've basically sketched a um, the basic compa components of a white rabbit system. On the very left, you have a white rabbit switch, which has 18 ports. You put in your 10 megahertz signal and your one PPS signal. And then the next module next to it, that is called an optic, or a, a small form factor uh, SFP. And what it basically does, it takes the electrical signal and it turns into, into a fiber signal, a fiber optic signal. And this is a somewhat special optic because it uses the same port for sending and transmitting. So you're not using two fibers like you normally would in telecommunication. You're using just one fiber. And the trick it uses is it's a sim uh, one wavelength in one direction and the other wavelength in the other direction. And so that means we use a single fiber instead of two fibers. And at the other end of the link, we have the same optic, and then we put it into some kind of white rabbit endpoint. It could also be another switch, uh, but many vendors uh, come out with different kinds of vendors, uh, sorry, different kinds of endpoints that you could use. And white rabbit is basically uh, building up on many of the already existing networking standards. First of all, it uses synchronous Ethernet. Synchronous Ethernet is where you use the actual bit carrier of the Ethernet, and it ends up at the at the other end, and you synchronize to that and you return that same bit carrier as well. Um, it uses precision time protocol to do the measurements of the round trip time and the offsets between the clocks. And like I said, it uses bidirectional fiber with two different wavelengths to use just a single fiber. And because it is based on ethernet, you can also just use it to carry data as well. So you still have a one gigabit ethernet link as well. And White Rabbit is now part of the IEEE P2P standard, is the uh, high accuracy protocol in the latest revision of P2P. So how does it, how does it achieve all these things? Well, I've, I've made a very sketch, sketchy sketch uh, of, of how it works. Yeah, you get a 10 megahertz into your FPGA, and at some point you have what we call a reference plane. That is the point where you, where you say, well, this is, because you have to, you have to care about all your cable delays, etc. But at some point, it gets ingested in the in the FPGA, and that gets clocked with it. And um, the FPGA drives the SFP, and then it goes into the fiber strand, and it ends up at the other end of the link. Um, and there's a number of fixed delays from the FPGA to basically the optical output of the SFP is something that you can. Uh, not directly measure, but the trick is you do a calibration step where you use different lengths of fiber, and from that you can calculate how it would work with zero length of fiber. And then you can just throw in any unknown amount of fiber, and it will just compensate for it. And the way it does it is it measures, well, it cannot measure the one-way delay, of course, because it, it doesn't know that, but it measures the round-trip delay. And if you've taken away all of the fixed calibrated uh, delays, then you are left with a round trip delay over the fiber. And normally you could simply estimate the one way delay out of this by dividing it by two, but that doesn't quite work because fiber has dispersion. And dispersion means that the propagation speed is dependent on the wavelength that you're using. And we're using one way, one wavelength to go that way, another wavelength to go that way, so they are slightly different. So you need to calibrate this for the actual wavelengths that you're using and also for the actual fiber that you're using. And uh, so, the important thing is that you keep using the same fiber, even though you don't know the exact length, perhaps. But it also compensates for changes in the delay of the fiber due to change in temperature. All of this gives you a uh, 
calibration accuracy for well better than a nanosecond, and a stability in the order of tens of picoseconds on your link. And White Rabbit, like I said, uh, takes the one-way delay and basically compensates the incoming timestamp and uh, subtracts the the one-way delay out of it, so that it doesn't matter how long your fiber is, it, it'll always uh, uh, have compensated for that. So the other thing I want to talk about today is interferometry, and interferometry is uh, where you use many uh, receptor stations, antennas, dishes, to measure the, how the phase and the amplitude varies over uh, as, as the signal comes into it. And as you measure these, you, um, you can actually try and reconstruct the image of, of the, th the source that you're looking for. And uh, at the left and the right, I have some examples of the kind of interferometric Interfer, interfer, oh gosh, interferometric arrays. Uh, this is my job. I should be able to say the word. <laughs> uh, on, on the left, you have the uh, very large array, uh, and on the right, you have the artist's impression of how the SKA array is going to look. It's currently still under construction, so that's why it's an artist's impression. And that one will actually use Wide Rabbit for distribution of the one PPS signal. Uh, so we've heard a lot about cross-correlation already and pseudo-random sequences. We also do cross-correlation, but we do it on truly random sequences. We have many antennas receiving the same noise, broadband noise from, from a faraway source. And you do, for each of the baselines, between each, each possible pair of antennas, you do the complex cross-correlation, cross which gives you the phase and the amplitude. And you use that to fill out basically the what we call the UV plane, in which is in wavelengths in both axes. And then um, you can do an inverse 2D transform and basically get your image back, except that you haven't actually measured all the possible uh, uh, positions, so you have huge gaps in, in your incoming data. And what you end up having to do is some very complicated uh, calibration routines, but eventually you should be able to reconstruct the, the image that you want. And just as an example, I've taken, I think, the most famous at the moment image that you can have in, via, in, in, in a radio interferometry, in, in this case, very long baseline interferometry, which is the uh, black hole in the center of our own Milky Way. This also did not use White Rabbit. I'm pretty sure of that, and we'll see why later in this talk. So imagine you have a perfect clock, a, an oscillator at a particular frequency, and then at another antenna, you also have the same signal, but there is phase noise on it. So the left is a perfect cosine, and the right is the same cosine, but with a little bit of phase noise. What, what we end up doing is doing the cross-correlation between the two. And if they were perfectly in phase, your cross-correlation product would basically be one. But these are, if, if you have a little bit of an angle difference, you start to lose some amplitude. And the coherence can actually be calculated. Um, this is already work that has been done by basically taking the integral over your uh, integration time of, of this cosine factor, which is all that, that is in there. And you can imagine if there are at 90 degrees, you are left with nothing. Um, there's also two bars around it uh, because we take the absolute volume. Because if you happen to end up in a situation where one of your clocks is 180 degrees out of phase, you end up with perfect coherence again, but with the wrong sign. So that's why there's these, uh, these bars around it. And I said integration time, because you're not doing this momentarily, but just like when you're doing cross-correlation for pseudo-random so, uh, sequences, you're, you're integrating over, say, a second or so, or a few seconds, in order to get enough sensitivity and to bring the noise down and the signal up. So the coherence loss is then simply 1 minus the coherence. Um, we're actually we're taking the, the RMS value of the coherence. And if you design a... Uh, ready interferometer, you want to make sure that the coherence loss is only a small a small contribution to your loss in sensitivity. Because if you have a lot of coherence loss, you've basically built very big antennas and you're still not very sensitive. So for the SKA one, uh, we set a design limit, or I should say a design limit was set that the coherence loss should not be more than 2% due to the clock distribution. Okay, a little bit more mathematics, but this is uh, as bad as it gets. Uh, the expected coherence 
uh, can be expressed in terms of an LM variation. And this is a huge formula, but the important part is here. You got the LM deviation mark or the LM variance marked as uh, uh, sigma squared of y, and then of two times and of four times and of a higher and higher, higher terms. And if you know what the LM deviation is, you could fill that in. Uh, the, funny of the, the interesting thing is you have LM deviations comes, comes in different cases, and one of them is the white noise case, white phase noise, which means that your clock errors are basically just phase jitter. In that case, um, it turns out that you have a particular slope on the LM deviation. I'll show that in the next slide. And you can simply calculate what, what this whole term between brackets should be. And that's some, and out of that pops a very simple uh, formula for the coherence loss and also for what the LM deviation is at any integration time. Um, the annoying thing here is that I just in the case of white noise, the LM deviation actually has a bit of a shortcoming. And that is the, the measured LM deviation ter turns out to depend on FH, which is the sample frequency. So if you measure your LM deviation more often, you end up with a different LM deviation than when you do it less often. It depends on whether you have white noise or white uh, uh, what is it? Fa white phase noise or white uh, what we see it in the next slide. And the other one that has an analytical si si uh, solution is white frequency noise. And then also from the LM deviation, you can again do, do the same so sum and you end up with a simple expression for what the coherence loss would be. So there's been much said already about LM deviations today and yesterday. And LM deviation is a notion of the fractional frequency error or fractional frequency stability. So you have to imagine, we, we're looking here at the left at the value of 10 minus 11. So if you have like a clock in 10, minus 10 megahertz, so that is 10, 7. And then so you're going to have like millihertz or so errors, uh, random errors on it. And then if you integrate longer, you have a longer integration time with the same kind of errors, the value actually goes down and down and down. As you can see, you, it goes down for flicker phase noise and white phase noise. It goes down with the slope of minus 1. And then for white frequency noise, where the actual the frequency varies, um, the slope will become minus and a half. And then for other noise processes that steer your clock or perturb your clock, you win up with a different slope. You can imagine that if you have a random walk of the of the frequency, then it does not necessarily even come back to where it started. So the longer you integrate, the more it goes up again. And if you have an actual frequency drift, that the longer you look, the more the frequency drifts away, then the error that you're getting is more and more increasing. Um, the other thing is we're, we're talking about LM deviations and LM variance. The LM deviation is simply the square root of the LM variance. So on the left, you have the LM deviation, uh, sigma y, and on the right, you have the LM variance, which is the sigma y squared. And this simply comes down from uh, the statistics that are used to calculate these things. Now, if we look at a white rabbit link, let's look, first of all, at the red line. Um, it doesn't quite match the graph in the sense that it doesn't go up again. It keeps going down almost forever. The reason for that is that a white rabbit link, if I measure the LM deviation be between the beginning and the end of the white rabbit link, it is a phase locked loop. So there is a limit to the error that can be. There can no be, cannot be on, on long term a, an actual frequency error. As long as the link never goes out of lock, the LM deviation keeps going down with a fixed slope of minus one. Uh, what you see here, uh, we're not going to go through all of the colors on this graph, but the red one is the LM deviation you get when you take two standard white rabbit switches and measure the LM deviation on that. And that's not bad, but the people who designed white rabbit designed it, uh, especially Ma Mattia did that. Um, we can actually do a lot better with this equipment and then they made a low jitter daughter board. And that is the blue line and that is like an order of magnitude better in LM deviation. And now we get to the point, what does this actually mean for if you want to use white rabbit? What you see here is the expected coherence loss for a particular uh, amount of LM deviation for, for the white frequency noise case, uh, and as a function of the observing frequency. And you see the first, the purple line, that is if you use your standard white rabbit switches, um, uh, it's in percent. It's a logarithmic scale, so it starts very low, but eventually if you get up to about, say, three giga two and a half gigahertz, you end up with this 2% loss line. And if you go higher in frequency, it goes up very quickly until you basically end up at the 100% loss, where you have 
where you're basically not seeing anything anymore. You've lost all your sensitivity. And so to improve on that, you can use the White Rabbit uh, Low Yeti Daughter Board, and that improves significantly. And then uh, it, it, it's about an order of magnitude better in Allen deviation. It also means that your upper frequency goes up with an order of magnitude, and then you can use it up to, say, 25 uh, gigahertz. Note that there's no error bars on this. This is just a uh, fairly theoretical exercise at the moment. I should actually take the Allen deviations that we've measured and properly fill this in and see. I mean, this should actually be wider lines or have proper error bars on it, of course. But you also see for the very high frequencies that are used in the EHT, the Event Horizon Telescope that did the, uh, um, the, the image of the black hole, well, that's in the hundreds of gigahertz, so you definitely could not use White Rabbit for that. Something else I want to discuss is about timing accuracy and how to connect your White Rabbit um, to your SDR. There's basically two cables between your SDR and, and your White Rabbit. Well, you start with your atomic clock or whatever other source of time that you have. Out of it, you get your 10 megahertz and your 1 pps. And, and we're going to hopefully see a lot of very interesting atomic clocks today. And out of it, you get 10 megahertz and 1 pps. And the rising edge of both is perfectly aligned with the start of the UTC second. That's what you want. Except it's not. Because what you're actually doing is the way White Rabbit works, but also the way your SDR works, is that the 1 pps isn't really the start of the second. The 1 pps signifies the rising edge of the 10 megahertz that is aligned with the start of the UTC second. And eventually, um, lot, lots, of, lots of other stuff happens, but it gets clocked into a flip-flop. The 10 megahertz is maybe upconverted first, but eventually you clock it into a flip-flop that remembers, okay, this is the start of a new second. This is the phase for a new second. And flip-flops don't like it if just right at the moment that the clock pulse comes, you also get uh, your data input changing. Um, what you actually need to protect your flip-flop a little bit in the sense that your, your signal has to be stable before and after. And this is called the setup time and the hold-up time. Hold time. The setup time is how much time your flip-flop input has to be stable before the clock edge, and the hold time is how much longer it should be remain stable before the clock uh, after the clock edge, because otherwise you run the risk of either the flip flop missing the transition and suddenly you're off by a uh, hundred nanosecond because at your, you're at the next ten megahertz cycle, or you can even end up in something that is called meta stability, where where the flip flop ends up oscillating for a little while before it settles to a random value. And that, of course, means you, you, you're going to have random errors of 100 nanoseconds. Uh, so I tried to make a graph of that. You have a, with the red cross, it's basically you must be at zero or at one. You should not be at any of the in, in between, uh, b between the setup time and the end of the hold time. And for a flip-flop, the setup time is always before and the hold time is after. But in a whole circuit, there can be different cable lengths to your flip-flop, etc. So it can very well be that your setup and your hold time both end up in a window that is before the actual clock edge at the connector. But these are things that you need to test. And um, ideally, your uh, equipment provider should tell you what the setup and the hold time are. For the White Rabbit switch, for instance, this is published. Um, while I was preparing this presentation, I was also looking for the setup and hold time values for the uh, Atos SDRs, because I know they've published this in the past. I know this because uh, I, I found the value for the X410. I sent them an email, could you give me the value for the X310, which is the one I had? And I didn't really get a satisfactory answer, and now I can't even find the X410 value anymore. Because what Atos says on the website now is that, well, yeah, if you have trouble, just go to the other edge. Um, so if you do that on the 10 megahertz, if you just said, ah, oh, I'll clock on the negative edge, you're off by 50 nanoseconds. If you do the wrong edge of the 1 PPS signal, you're going to be off by a huge fraction of a second. So these things, I, I think, are not really suitable solutions. Um, what you should do is, well, ideally, you want your PPS signal to come in slightly before your 10 megahertz. But that breaks causality. You can't do that. So what you need to do instead is use a few meters of cable on your 10 megahertz so it arrives a little bit later, and then calculate how much delay you've introduced and take account of that in all your calibrations so that you actually have a good timing value. So in the uh, White Rabbit uh, model that I showed earlier, you simply have 
Signal goes one way, signal goes the other way. You measure the round trip time, you compensate for the uh, dispersion, and you're done. And it doesn't really matter how long your cable is up to the reach of your optics. And the original White Rabbit design used optics with a range of 10 kilometers. And that's good enough for the LHC. Um, we like our interferometric, interferometric I have to practice word. Uh, we, li we like them bigger in the sense that the longer the distances between the dishes, the larger the resolution that, that you can achieve. And then 10 kilometers uh, doesn't cut it. You can cascade multiple white rabbit switches, but eventually you're cascading many PLLs and the, and the phase noise gets worse. So you don't want to do that as well. But what you can do is you can simply go to a website and buy bidirectional optics that have 80 kilometer reach. And you think, well, great solution. Now I can do 80 kilometers. But then you start to be hit by some facts of physics. And one of them is that if you have a fiber link and it has, like I said, dispersion, now imagine your wavelength changes a little bit due to the temperature of the switch uh, going up. If your wavelength changes a little bit, your propagation delay changes a little bit in a way that White Rabbit cannot tell apart from uh, the cable being longer or shorter. So you introduce a timing error. Uh, we, we've actually done like measurements, like how much, how much does the wavelength change as a function of temperature. Um, we try to measure the, the SFP temperature because you can read it out and compensate for that. But all of that turned out to be very complicated and not very reproducible. So instead of that, we embedded it and we found um, stabilized optics. You can find optics in the market which are not much more expensive that have a very tight stabilization of the laser wavelength. And these are used in commercial high capacity networks. So you can put many wavelengths very close to each other in a technique called dense wavelength division uh, multiplexing, DWDM. And they basically have a small temperature sensor inside and a servo loop that just keeps the temperature and therefore the wavelength at perf perfectly the right position. And that stabilize, stabilizes them to well within a, nan a nanometer. So with that, we built a 35 kilometer white rabbit link. And we also used the same technique to build a 169 kilometer white rabbit link. And that particular white rabbit link used frequencies outside of the normal wavelengths that are used for, say, uh, digital communications, uh, data communications. And the reason for that is white rabbit needs to go back and forth over the same fiber. You need that because you want to say at some point, half, half of this corrected for the dispersion difference, is my halfway round trip time. Um, data communication network don't work that way. They have one fiber going one that way, one fiber going that way. So you need to actually mux out your white rabbit wavelengths, use wavelengths that are not in use for data traffic, and then you can, if you have a uh, network provider that is actually willing to uh, support that kind of research, then you can actually run it on a production network even without introducing any downtime while you add these wavelengths and while you configure all of this. And that is important because if you're trying to achieve a long distance, then it is much cheaper to use somebody else's fiber than to lay your own. So this is an image of the network that was built. On the right, you have the Westerbork Synthesis Radio Telescope in the Netherlands, which has its own maser. And from there, we had a um, White Rabbit uh, Grandmaster switch. And then we had to link all the way north over 67 kilometers of fiber to the city of Groningen, where we had an optical amplifier. And this is actually over a prediction network with many 100 gigabit uh, wavelengths on it. And then we went back the same way to the same location where the telescope is, which is also a network pop, which is very convenient. Another optical amplifier, and then we had 35 kilometers of dark fiber to the village of Dwingelo, where the historic 25 meter uh, dish is, which is now run by volunteers. And using uh, an Atus SDR and a flowchart I made and these wide rabbit links, we were able to actually do um, interferometry between these two telescopes at a distance of about 20 kilometers apart from each other. And one way that you can see how well your interferometry works is again by doing an Allen deviation, but in this time we're doing the Allen deviation on the face of. Uh, observed between the two telescopes on a very bright and compact far away quasar. Um, it's a strong radio source and we had a signal, of, signal to noise of over 200 because these are fairly big dishes, 25 meter each. 
And you can see the black line is we measured the, 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 the part that goes back and forth. We measured the Allen deviation. And that's the black line. And that is sort of our lower limit. If everything worked perfectly, our measurement would have like the same Allen deviation. But of course, you are still limited in sensitivity. There is still a little bit of extra noise. So we end up a little bit higher in the Allen deviation on actually observing this astronomical source. And I did one run of 19, 90 minutes on the 35 kilometer direct link and once on the 169 back and forth and then 35 kilometer link. And there's not, real dis not a real difference in performance in the two graphs, um, which indicates that we could possibly extend the link much further. Eventually at uh, like five minutes or so integration time, they do start to differ, but that is simply because these measurements were not taken at the same time. And what we are having is that the ionosphere is changing and is causing phase errors. And we know in VLBI that uh, you don't want to integrate at much longer than five minutes. You need to actually re recalibrate again all the time because, because of the changes in the ionosphere. And the other thing is that we are possibly seeing some effects of the structure of the source itself. So in conclusion, and so that we're in, in time for lunch, White Rabbit, I think, is a useful way to distribute a reference clock for interferometry. And it's usable off the shelf for like 2.5 gigahertz signals. And with a low jitter device, a uh, daughter board up to 25 gigahertz. And we've proven that it works for at least 170 kilometers. And we think we it can go much longer. Uh, it can co coexist with other users on the same fiber, which can make it a lot more cheap to 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 to, uh, to build out such a network and we've successfully shown VLBI observations um, over 35 and 170 kilometer links and finally this is the uh, white rabbit logo which is a little hair or rabbit of course running through a accelerator tunnel at uh, at CERN and making sure can't be late can't be late like in the Lewis Carroll bo uh, book thanks for your attention any questions please Question about the white rabbit uh, equipments and switch. Uh, is it easy to find these equipments uh, in in Europe? Yeah, uh, like I said, it's open hardware, and there are m multiple vendors that um, that build this. And there's two variants. You can have like the CERN design, which is completely open hardware, open software. And many of the vendors have also taken that design and added their own improvements. Um, and around price to it. Uh, but yeah, there I, I can give you four or five companies that make white rabbit, white rabbit switches. And currently, the group is designing new switches that will actually use 10 gigabit Ethernet. So you have more data capacity as well. But yeah, you can just buy them off the shelf. Uh, the only issue might be component shortages, which is also one of the reasons to do the white rabbit switch redesign. It's a, it's a design from, I think, 2009 or so by now, maybe earlier. And some of the components are simply no longer available. And that's the other reason that, th that there's now a new generation of switch under development. If I may compliment on your slide number three, you have the white rabbit switch uh, on your left and the seven soul Zen on the right. I would strongly avoid anyone to get the seven soul or now Aurelia solution, which doesn't share data. So like uh, Paul said, one of the highlights of white rabbit, you've got this dark fiber that just is waiting for you to transfer data. And that is working very beautifully over White Rabbit Switch, which has been updated lately to White Rabbit Switch Firmware 6. And when you ask 7Sol for an update, they just tell you buy a new one because we're a company and uh, we're, not on, we're not updating our hard hardware. So avoid at all cost Aurelia. And the second thing is uh, be careful that, I, I don't know if you had the issue, Paul, but when we connect X310 on the White Rabbit Switch, the jumbo packets don't get routed between the different ports. So the X310 is running packets bigger than one kilobyte and the routing protocol of a white rabbit switch default configuration is that it will not route the eight kilobyte packets. So you need to tell, uh, it's now documented, but if you search white rabbit switch jumbo packet, you got the solution, but at the time we did not. So you have to hit the right register with the right bits <laughs> to get the X310 packets routed. Yeah, well, actually, the bandwidth that we're using here is slightly more than a gigabit. So we never put the traffic through the white rabbit switch. The, the SDR traffic simply went on a separate 10 gigabit fiber. Um, 
So we never ran into the problem. We never tried to put a, push the bandwidth through the X310. The, the reason we did it is we had to go through multiple firewalls uh, between our university, our different places, and we had these dark fibers just lying between the various sites and we, we ran it. So. Uh, this is using a fiber. Is it also possible to get a similar performance with UTP? Well, no. Uh, UTP has four strands and they all have different amount of uh, coiling. Uh, which means that propagation speeds are different. Um, there, there's a lot more happening in, in a UTP cable than the simple amplitude modulation that you have in, uh, in, in White Rabbit over fiber. Um, people have definitely tried it, but I don't think you get nearly as good a performance as you can get on a fiber. Yeah, they, they claim you break white rabbit performances once you get into copper. Yeah. I, I couldn't hear. Uh, you, you, break, you break the performance yeah. of, of once you leave. It, it's great because your 2.5 gigahertz uh, obviously is 400 picoseconds, and 400 picoseconds is more or less eight to nine times with the 60 picosecond jitter of white rabbit. So it's, it's beautiful as, as, as the conclusion, it, it nicely matches the.